like to start with this is the just money festival um, hosted by the alliance for just money and we would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that the alliance for just money is based out of illinois which includes ancestral lands of the peoria kaskaskia piankasha um Wea, Miami, Muscotin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and the Chickasha Nations. We have a responsibility to acknowledge these Native nations and to work with them as we move forward as a vibrant, inclusive organization. Um, we invite you to learn more about the Native nations where you reside by going to nativeland.ca and to learn whether where you reside is situated on treaty land or unceded land by going to the link shared in the chat. Um, so I invite you all to um, take a moment, see where you are at and if you know already, that is great. Otherwise, just take a moment to figure that out. And in the chat, as a round of introduction, we are going to um, put your name, your pronouns, and where you are from, and whose land you are on. So I will give an example in the chat for myself. And then um, as I go on, if you all could just uh, share where you are at, where you're signing in from. Um, Carly, and my pronouns are she and they. You can use either with me. I'm comfortable with both. Yeah, if you all could just share where you are coming in from, that would be great because we are all over. Okay. As you are um, adding in the chat where you're coming from, um, I just want to go over some ground rules that we will follow throughout our uh, festival today. Um, so we want to respect the discussion and the moderators and presenters. Listen actively to the speakers, especially when they're laying out guidelines for discussions like right now. Um, share the air and encourage others to share as well. This is like the step up, step back rule. You want to step up to encourage those who have not participated and step back to make sure you are not dominating the conversation. Um, that is a very important one <laughs> to remember. Um, practice good faith. We cannot know the reasons that a person expresses an idea. Assume the best of your peers' intentions in case of disagreement. And equally important, take responsibility for your own impact that you have in this space. Um, consider your position. Think consciously of your social positions, allowing us to work across our race, gender, sexuality, and social differences in ways that are supportive. Um, make I statements. We all make mistakes. And however upset a peer's mistake makes you, you also have a responsibility to deal with it in as empathetic a way as you can. And remember to avoid jargon. If you find someone using jargon, just say something in the chat, speak up. If you feel yourself using jargon, especially acronyms, spell them out. Um, especially in this field, it is very easy to throw around terms that some of us might be comfortable with and then others may not know what we're talking about. So really be mindful of that um, while you are sharing whatever it is that you're sharing. Um, there will be portions of the event where the chat will be disabled. This is to op optimize speaker engagement. Um, so when the chat is active, we do ask that you follow the above principles um, that are also shared on the screen and do your best to stay on topic. We do have some people that are watching the chat and if it gets off topic or if we're not following the, um, the guidelines, then um, they might reach out to you separately and uh, um, just kind of let you know that those are not within our chat guidelines. Um, 
if there is ever an opportunity to participate, um, like in some of our breakout rooms um, and possibly in some of our other sessions, you can um, hover over the reactions and raise your hand. Um, and that will alert whoever is responsible that um, the people with their uh, hands raised will have something to share. Um, and if you're having any issues with that function, you can always go in the chat and put your name followed by stack, kind of like this. Um, and that will also work. Um, <clears throat> so without Further ado, I would like to uh, bring Virginia forward so she can give a little uh, update on, or not update, but an intro to the Alliance for Just Money to tell you who we are and what we're about. Well, I'm honored to welcome you and have the first word here. Thank you for joining us today. We are here because we're optimists and realists while we're facing a deeply dysfunctional nation and existential threats, we believe that we can do better. We're worried about the State of the Union and our planet's future. And at the Alliance, we have researched and studied and discussed the evidence and concluded that the money system is at the root of most of our problems, even the attitudes that perpetuate the problems. We believe we can change the money system and that we must. We hope you'll join us in taking action for a better world. As individuals and as an organization, we are committed to continuing our research, sharing what we've learned with the public, and enrolling a majority in working toward a just money system. The American Monetary Institute was our parent. Many of us attended their annual conferences for years, connecting with each other, deepening our understanding of the money system, and nurturing a growing sense that it was time to move beyond the think tank stage. The Alliance for Just Money was founded to be an active outreach organization. It has taken three years of dedicated volunteer effort to lay the groundwork and get these outreach efforts underway. With WiseView web developments, expertise, and design, we've built a website rich with information and with links to further information in an extraordinary bibliography developed by Hovert Schuller, which may be one of the best bibliographies on money on the web. We've been holding regular coffee houses, had very active discussion boards, Members have gotten money reform on the Green Party platform, made presentations to various conferences, created curriculums, held book clubs, and begun outreach efforts to the League of Women Voters, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We started two petitions, a general petition asking for money reform and a petition asking for a national commission to study our money system options. We've been contacting our Congress people, asking them to consider co-signing a bill that was previously presented in 2011 as the NEED Act. We are a membership organization. Members make the action happen. And your participation counts. Please sign our petitions, contact your congressperson, and ask them to study how the money system makes many of our problems inevitable and how changing the money can make it possible to fix our problems. Please share our posts on social media. A little bit of your time can go a long way and it will matter. We hope you'll join us officially. The more we can grow our membership, the more influence we will have. I'm excited to be here today. I hope you're ex equally excited and to have, I'm excited to have you with us. And with huge thanks to Carly Enger for her excellent festival organizing leadership. Welcome. Let's begin. Thank you, Virginia. And Mark is going to chime in to fill us in on what's happening on the international front. Thanks, Carly. Um, on the international front, I think the, the most important thing is to kind of understand the, the framework of it. Um, the international uh, movement for monetary reform uh, was organized some years ago under an umbrella of positive money. I, it's, it's, it's there because I think we recognize the international 
nature of our monetary system, but we also recognize that each individual country must enact it, its own reforms to uh, promote uh, sovereign money. The IMMR is made up of 27 member nations, um, and those range from South Africa to Canada to US, um, a lot of um, European nations, Israel. Um, so we're not alone. Um, this is a global movement. Um, I know we focus on the United States here at the Alliance, but this is an actual global movement. The IMMR has a core group of five people who work to promote it. Um, we were recently elected in the spring, um, the new core group was. And so our job is really to, to help organize. Um, one of our main goals for this year is to formally organize the IMMR as a nonprofit organization, um, to set up bank accounts and things like that. Like I said, currently we go through Positive Money, which is a, another monetary organization that's based in the UK. So our goal is to um, set up an actual not-for-profit organization. And also uh, we have established um, several working groups that people are welcome to be a part of that cover various um, issues around monetary reform from an international perspective. Um, because sometimes I think we do get uh, lost or have the tendency to get lost in just our own system uh, here in the United States. And we have to recognize that the monetary system is international um, and that there are international consequences to changing uh, the monetary system, especially here uh, in the United States where uh, we have the reserve dollar. So what we do will affect the entire world. Um, and so I think that's enough, Carly. I just wanted to uh, why would you ask me to? So welcome everybody and uh, I hope you in enjoy uh, the festival. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, the money system is definitely not just a United States issue, it is a global issue. And um, yeah, if you want to get involved on the international front, that's happening too right here with the Alliance for Just Money. So keep that in mind. Um, and now we shall uh, hop into the festival. Um, so thank you, Virginia and Mark, for giving that uh, lively overview of the Alliance for Just Money and uh, IMMR. I appreciate that. Um, we are excited to have you all here for our first ever Just Money Festival. Maybe we can keep it up, who knows? Um, we hope to keep this light. We hope that we all walk away inspired. Um, here at the Alliance for Just Money, we have some great minds, which if you were here last night, you definitely saw that and you will see that today. Um, so we are really excited to make this Just Money thing a movement and see where it takes us. So on today's agenda, we have an amazing lineup that begins with our keynote from Katerina Serafimova. She is here in the crowd um, to uh, get us started today on the festival. As a social entrepreneur, weaver, and facilitator, Katerina is passionate about co-creating solutions to reconnect nature, money, and community. With many years of experience in international project development and management, Having worked with consulting, sustainable finance, and NGOs in the area of sustainable resources, agriculture, and finance, Katerina believes in collaborative commons. Since 2014, she has been a lecturer at University of Zurich, and since 2017, Katerina co-creates the initiative uh, Terra Centropica and the local foods food networks in Mertola, Portugal, as well as the Global Initiative Food Networks. So I would like to please welcome Katarina to the spotlight. Thank you, Carly, and thank you everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. That's wonderful. And actually, I was I'm very excited that he, uh, you can have me uh, from across the ocean, from across the Atlantic. So I'm, I'm actually here in, in Switzerland, in Europe. <laughs> and one thing that you didn't represent or um, what you didn't mention is that I was very active in the monetary movement and uh, bringing actually a constitutional change 
to be voted upon a Swiss initiative where the entire population could vote on changing the monetary system, which was a very deep and exciting experience and very marking experience in my life. So maybe later on we can we can um, explore that a bit deeper on um, as this goes to the core of the topic. Um, actually, before I go and Carly, you asked me also my my reason why. Um, but actually, before I can, I, I would like to do that. If it's okay for you, we are not too many. I would like to get a feeling over the Atlantic who is in the room, if that is possible. Just if everyone could just say his name, maybe the the city where he's she is from, and one just one sentence of what do you what is for you the purpose of money? Um, I I would love that so that we have all everyone in this space and then we can we can take it from here. I don't know, Virginia, would you like to start? Just, you know, one sure. sentence. Um, Virginia from Portland, Oregon. Yes. Uh, um, money is a unit of account, a medium of exchange and a formative influence on society. Thank you. You can just give it to the next so that we can just, you know, ping pong it around the room and uh, pretend we are sitting in a circle. I can, I can jump. Uh, Stephen uh, Walsh, uh, Chicago, Potawatomi, uh, indigenous people of this area. Um, I, money is the lifeblood of society. And I'm always very curious about money and society. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to pass it on to someone? Um, I, I'll pass it back to Mark. He's the only next person on my screen. Right, perfect. Uh, yeah, Mark Young, um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, for me, uh, changing the money system is just about creating a better world. It's just that simple. Um, it's about the future. It's about our kids. Um, it's about leaving a fair and just society uh, for the future. Thank you. Um, and I will go to who I see on my screen is John Howell. Thanks, Mark. Well, I see uh, money is, uh, I'm in Athens, Ohio, but I lived for 10 months in Switzerland, in Bern. So at any rate, uh, 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 I see money as a, as a medium of exchange primarily, but it is those other things Virginia mentioned. Thank you. Let me, let me call on, uh, um, let me call on Steve Norris. Yeah, uh, Steve Norris uh, near Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and money um, could enable the change we need in this world. Thank you. Call on uh, Chris. Hello, I'm Chris, uh, pronounce he him um, from Guelph, so-called Canada on Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, First Nation land. Um, I, I just think, I just see money as a really important tool that we can use to change the world for a better place. Um, and I will pass it to uh, Carly. I am Carly. My pronouns are she and they. I am on the ancestral lands of the Clackamas and Cowlitz nations. And I see money as a very powerful tool that can be used for good or bad. And hopefully we can make it be used for more good than bad in the future. Wonderful. Would you like to pass it? And I will pass it on to, let me see my view. I'll pass it on to Jerry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Geraldine Perry from Orland Park, Illinois, which is southwest of Chicago. Um, and uh, pretty much all of the above about money. Uh, it's a, a uh, method of exchanging exchanging um, the products that we create and um, uh, enriching our nation through those uh, through the wealth that we're creating. Thank you. Would you like to pass it to someone? Oh, um, <laughs> just someone that appears in your screen. I have um, Alliance for Just Money. I don't know the name. Paul. Oh. I guess that would be me. Okay. 
Uh, my name is Alfonso. Uh, Alfonso Saldana. I live in Pennsylvania. And uh, for me, uh, money is a tool that for a long time has been used for the wrong uh, purposes. But I'm here to expand my knowledge about money and how we can use it for good. Pass. Thank you. Yes, I'll pass it to, uh, let's go to okay. Bruce Rogers. My name is Bruce Rogers Vaughn, he, him, his. I live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is just south of Nashville, Tennessee. And um, I believe uh, that money is not a thing that we hold in our hands, not a commodity. Instead, it's a relational process that can be used for good or evil. Thank you. Did you pass it to someone? I'll go. Mary. Go oh. ahead, Mary. Hello, everyone. Um, um, I'm Mary. I'm in southern Wisconsin on Potawatomi and Ho-Chunk land. And I appreciate money as a medium of exchange and a, a way of valuing things. But our world is dominated by that other use of money, which is as a lever to concentrate wealth. And that's where I want to learn what to do about it. <laughs> uh, go ahead, okay. Lucille. Hi, I'm Lucille Eckrish in Bloomington Normal, Illinois. Um, and uh, money uh, ex uh, facilitates balanced exchange um, ah. and credit interest-bearing credit acting as money does not facilitate balance exchange. Thank you. I will pass to my spouse who is not in Bloomington, Illinois, but California, Oakland, California, Fran Deckrish. Hi, I'm Eckrich, currently in Oakland, California, originally from Germany, the Southwest of Germany and uh, reciting yeah, in Bloomington. I think the land belonged to the Kickapoo Indians, right? Bloomington, yeah. And uh, money for me is essential in order to achieve just exchange on all human interactions. Thank you. Would you like to pass it to someone that appears there? <clears throat> pass it, Franz. Oh, uh, well, I don't know too many people. Uh, Doesn't matter. <laughs> the names are there. Oh, I don't see. Uh, so Bruce Wall. All right. Um, I would, uh, I'm in, from Chicago or living in Chicago and uh, money is tied to, is a, is a, is a way of um, relations that involves promises. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Um, Jawad. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Jawad or Zahid. I'm talking from uh, Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. If you know it, it's it's a small country between India and Myanmar. And uh, my understanding about money is that money is medium of exchange uh, and it's a means of facilitating transaction. Thank you, Ahad. Uh, okay, I'll uh, take John Lodenka. Okay, I'm uh, John Lodenkamper from uh, Denver, Colorado, and Arapaho land. And uh, I think the key thing for me is that with the current debt creation of money, it really prevents a lot of the uh, necessary spending to counter climate change, inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a big hurdle to all the things we need to do. Thank you. Do you like to pass it? No, well, I keep trying to get the gallery view and it keeps going back to the same people. So I can't see who to pass it to. So why don't you pick somebody? So Lucille, 
I cannot see you, but I think. So that's, I think somebody else, uh, uh, whoever has my name on the screen, uh, unmute yourself. And I think you used my link. It's probably Howard or Mark Pesh. Do I have your link? Uh, no, but you can introduce yourself. Somebody else. Good. <laughs> I don't know who that is. I finally got in. I'm Mark Pash, uh, the uh, number one uh, economic factor of uh, of an economy is by far money. Thank you. Do you like to pass it to someone? Or otherwise, who did not speak yet can also just join in. Jan Frieswick? You have to unmute. Greetings, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Ho-Chunk Ho -chunk <laughs> territory. Uh, and I'm gonna give a little different answer to this. Um, in the United States, uh, money is green, it smells funny, and for most people, that's where their security is, uh, so I call it God. Thank you very much. Would you like to pass it on? Be here. Um, whoops. <laughs> oh, dear. How about Tabitha? Oh, I'm sorry. Somehow I got out of, uh, I can't see anybody. Yeah, uh -oh. no worries. We can. I pulled Tabitha forward. How about Tabitha? Okay. Um, Tabitha, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So we're on Apache and Pueblo lands. Um, for me, I see money as a means to make our lives and our world better. Um, a tool. Cool. Yeah. And I will pick, let's see here, Lee Kochel. So it's Lee Kochel? Yes, Lee Kochel. Um, a third of my relatives are part Chippewa, and uh, I see just money as a means for enabling everyone to participate in the common culture. Thank you. Who did not speak yet? Rosalind Hammer. Hammer? Yes, I'm in. Uh, I I go by she and her, and I'm in Portland, Oregon, on Cowlitz and Clackamas. Uh, native territory, and I, I'm troubled by the maldistribution of money, and what a terrible price so many people pay. So I would like to see um, change. Thank you. How about John Sp Spansky? Spansky, that's John. Spansky. Uh, yes. My name is John Spansky. I uh, live on the Ahara River, where. Uh, Mary Sanderson lives. That's uh, uh, Yahara means catfish in the whole chunk language. Um, I'm interested in how money works and how economic systems work. Um, and uh, lately, especially the uh, uh, wealth gap mm -hmm. and uh, what that does to uh, does to all of us. And let's see, is there anybody left to? How about Joshua Harrow? Okay. Hi, uh, yeah, Joshua Harrow. And uh, on, in, in Toronto, um, Mississaugas of the Credit Territory, uh, most recently. And um, I see money as uh, kind of, I, I feel like the, potential of it is to be apolitical, amoral, um, but I understand it isn't right now. Uh, so I hope it will be 
just a neutral uh, medium of uh, exchange of value. Thanks. Thank you, Joshua. How about Clark Joseph? Hi, um, Clark Joseph, he, him on stolen Algonquin territory, Ottawa. Money, what do I know about money? I'm gonna say nothing. I know very little. I do know, I see it as a tool. I would like it to be used for human healing, for human need, for human flourishing, and not for corporate greed, dominance and destruction. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Clark. How about Will Decker? Unmute, Will, unmute. There we go. I'm Will Decker. I'm in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm on Muskogee land. I probably ought to go back to Baden-Baden where great grandpa came from. And um, um, I look at money as, uh, as what uh, Stephen Zarlinga uh, told us about in the law science of money. It was, it was invented by the paleo man to give gifts of love. And that's what the NEDAC can do we can give money as a gift of love. Thank you. About John, is that John Conroy? Yes, it's John Conroy in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, money is a type of facilitator. It's a legal construct and it ends up being a uh, medium of exchange. And a, um, a good money is usually a store of value also. Thank you, John. Thank you. How about Matt Crahan? Crahan. I'm in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I look upon money as a means of exchange. As long as it's sound and stable, it can ser uh, serve that purpose quite well. But we have a situation where it's anything but sound and stable, and that's why we're all here today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Matt. How about Brett? Barnt, you may you may need to unmute Brett. How, let's go on to Joshua. Oh no, Mike Holden. Yes, Holden, we can't hear you, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Mike, maybe maybe you want to write your part in the chat because unfortunately you're breaking and and uh, the connection seems not working so well. How how about that gentleman from uh, the Netherlands, Holbert Schuller? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, my name is Robert Schuller. I'm originally from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam. At this moment in Naperville, uh, Illinois, um, but on my way to India, where I will not be too far away from uh, Javad Zahid in Bangladesh, whom I hope to uh, visit. Um, as Bruce Wall, with whom I have some philosophical uh, uh, affinity uh, said, uh, money is a promise. I think money is a possibility which expresses the fundamental future oriented nature of man. And I'll leave it at that. Hey, we expected nothing less, Holbert. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Uh, is that Tom at 773? Tom, Wilda, okay. How about area code 818? I'm not sure. And how about, oh, Joe Bongiovanni. Come on, Joe. So somehow people are muted and need to yeah. either be yeah. unmuted. Otherwise, they can also always, you know, put their part in the chat if, yeah, if there's might, anyone, if there's anyone. On the phone. I think we're pretty good. Cool. 
So let's let's go on. I think that was wonderful. So I could feel. Wait, 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 wait! You, yeah. didn't, you didn't get me. Oh, Paul! <laughs> Jump in! Jump in! <laughs> Last One but not time. least, because I have a different take on it. So I'm kind of surprised that the 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 responses are somewhat understated and technical. I mean, I've been thinking about this as a very, very profound question. Uh, for me, for a society to exist, we have to share the wealth that each of us creates individually for us to survive. And money is the only way at this point to, to be able to accomplish that. That's, that's how I see money. And I think it's a question that really we should explore at that more deep philosophical level. Oh, I'm, I'm in Annapolis, Maryland, and I'm on the lands of the Piscataway tribe. Very grateful for all of your statements. Very grateful also for the last one that um, is very profound. And actually, I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with uh, Rudolf Steiner from the Anthroposophy. He used to say that money is actually the spiritual element of the economy. That may sound a bit strange, but this is how he was seeing because, you know, only humans need that kind of, of, of abstract thing, you know. And um, to me, money has a lot to do with what was said before with relationship. And in a way, one could say, um, the money system is built in a way how we want to create the relationship, or we could put it the other way around. The current monetary system works very well for those that created it, right? So it tells us about the kind of relationship we can see that um, it is about extracting resources or it leads to extracting resources. It leads to um, probably you have been talking a lot about the monetary system as it is today. I think when I joined, uh, I think Virginia Hammond was, was talking about it. So money being created as that by private banks. Um, this leads to a situation that basically in this, from the starting point onwards, everyone is in debt and everyone is in a situation of scarcity. And that leads to a relationship, a kind of relationship of, of, of separation between people and separation from the land, from nature. And um, I, I have been observing and looking and maybe um, I start with who I am <laughs> and then this, what brought me to that conclusion and what brought me to really looking into very different endeavors of how to change the monetary system from, from many different perspectives and angles. Um, I, I grew up in Portugal actually with my children's room to the ocean, very connected to nature. And I, when I grew up, I wanted to understand how ecosystems work, how nature works. And I, I, I did that. I went to Switzerland because there I was allowed to study all the natural science, sciences at the same time. So I didn't need to pick one because for me it was clear that by just, you know, looking at one part, I would never understand the whole thing. And that was a wonderful time. I met People, I don't know if you're familiar, in, I had also an American professor on water that marked me very profoundly because she combined actually the natural sciences, holistic looking at systems and looking at what water actually is. But she combined that also. She was a Zen Buddhist with a, a different perspective on, on life and an understanding that we are part of a living being, living organism and doing that as a natural scientist. So I, I, I had a wonderful, wonderful time then understanding these complex systems, beginning to worry about climate change and, and the ecosystems and how, how we actually, where we are at as humanity. And when I started my, my career, I started in a consultancy company where we developed big, huge land projects. And I quickly understood that the more success I had, the more, the bigger uh, our clients were, like the World Bank and others, uh, the less and the, the bigger my team grew at the time and I, the career in such was, the less that had to do with why I felt I was here on this planet, the less they, that had to do with people, with communities, and with everything I even learned at university about ecosystems. So as I, I started wondering very early of, of what is there, what I didn't understand. And it turned out that the part that I wasn't told had to do with money. So the last 20 years I've been researching and 
and, and looking at what actually is this gap between people, what we call money and nature. And um, I, I, I did, in, first of all, an inner journey of reading, of reading a lot of books. But I said, I, I do want to understand that even better. So I moved on and got hired by a bank to really understand how are decisions made. So I became the head of sustainability of a Swiss private bank to understand that better. And from there, I moved on to um, WWF, where I was um, building up the team on really researching the interaction between nature and monetary flows. So we looked at the different agro commodities and who are the ones financing that? Who are the ones ensuring that? How is the financial flow? And increasingly, I started to understand, and that was very interesting for me, that in a way, one could look at money like the water system. And if we would understand better the water system, so that was where I grew up in on all levels, be it as a child in the ocean, be it um, as a natural scientist, there are some, some real deep learnings that we can have about the monetary system if we look at it from that side. So I modeled the financial flows into the Congo Basin, into the Amazon to understand who are actually the players and what is happening there. But soon I understood, I always looked for the biggest leverage points for change. I looked for who are the most powerful institutions who could, you know, really make a change. So I understood quickly that even by working, reporting to a CEO of a Swiss private bank, I couldn't make so much of a change. We could issue some green financial products, financial products, we could do a certain, certain, certain offerings to certain interested clients. But this, this was not what I was looking for. So I, I was sort of moving on. And I, I looked even then at, we, we, we tried to understand and, and went together with uh, McKinsey and other organizations to interview 50 central bankers around the world to understand how do they see that link? How broad do and they understand actually their task? Do they just look at monetary stability or, or, or in some inflation? Or do they make that connection? And interestingly enough, we found some that at least privately did look at these things um, more broadly. And through this work, we even got, um, yeah, with other, many other organizations, we engaged a lot at the time with the Chinese government because the Chinese government, you wouldn't think of it, you wouldn't believe it, was the first of putting the agenda on, of green finance to the ministry level or the finance minister as they were issuing the green credit guidelines 10 years ago already or 15 years ago already. Because they understood that if they wanted to, you know, ensure 100 years perspective of resources for China, it's not about being good people, it's about, you know, re that, that perspective, they understood that a banking and a financial and a monetary system as we have will not function in that way. So that was a very interesting moment in time where we could actually collaboratively with others bring the topic of ecosystems and looking at environmental aspects to the agenda of finance ministers. It was at the time the G20 talks with the Chinese government, or they, they were leading them. Then the next round was actually the German government when it was leading. And there was um, quite, quite some interesting working groups. But actually I observed over and over again over these 20 years of engaging with this topic, and it had something, after a while, I understood that it had something to do with me. I understood that actually, um, in order to be invited to the next conference or in order to you know, do the next report with McKinsey, there is a very subtle mechanism that I don't talk really my truth. So that it, it's, it's, you know, there are some things that about the monetary system and about, um, we yeah, have financial institutions that is, is, is sort of okay to say and to criticize. And there were certain things that I understood and I, I, I really wanted to understand what is that that is really so fundamental that it's difficult to talk about. That was a very interesting process for me. I, um, 
I also observed that in this political work, in the lobbying work, because you mentioned before that it's about lobbying the Congress people, and yes, of course, that's about that as well. But I, I realized in this lobbying work that the, the nearly of the same words, actually, from the beginning, which were at the time um, really substantially about, about looking at the fundamental, let's say, playing conditions or framework conditions for financial institutions or for monetary policy were within a very short time watered down that after a while we and people were just talking about more green bonds, which is not, as we know, a fundamental change to the monetary system. So that process of, of really um, within the political uh, let's say, path of, of, of lobbying and making a change, but it happens so quickly the, that there is an inertia of the system that really fundamental change are, are difficult to make. I, I also, well, I, yeah, I, in parallel, I um, engaged with different people on my path of really looking very deep and understanding what actually money is engaging with, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Professor Bernard Lieter, he died, he was a Belgian, um, uh, from Belgium, Belgium? Um, a professor on, on, and really he was a central banker at the time and advising on the creation of the euro at the time. Unfortunately, they didn't took his advice. He wanted the euro to be a complementary currency to the existing currencies. And he and others really looked at what we need for our future is to really mirror the kind of relationships that we want to have and we value and that value what we value as people. We need an ecosystem of solutions. So there will be not one solution, but rather an ecosystem of solutions. We will need um, currencies to store value, for example, right? So that we are able to invest into let's say certain regions and bring liquidity into certain regions. And then um, this, this, this currency stores a certain value. But then, and maybe you're just feel, getting a feeling for it, it's, it's all about that we need to understand more the natural behavior like water, right? <laughs> what we also need is then within a region that it really circulates very well. We also need a certain monetary quality within, let's say, a village or a regional context, which allows a high velocity of the money to really flow and to enable a vibrant marketplace in the town, in the region. So this is a very, you could say, opposing um, qualities of, of behavior of different monies, let's say, in that ecosystem. And only if we really understand how that could function and work, uh, we would have, uh, we would then create a system which enable and which actually helps the people and don't make the people the servants of the economy. And um, I maybe go there later, what I discovered, how that could work and how we actually already tried it out in some, some, some prototypes, but I just continue for, um, for my biographical thing about what led me there. I, I never, I'm very, I uh, appreciate it very much to be invited in the US conference. I was only once in, in the US and it was actually very interesting because it was out of my um, work as an environmentalist. It was out of my work uh, on, on, on researching and doing, actually at the time we did a with McKinsey and with one of the big Swiss banks, we did a report on decarbonizing the bank's portfolios. So basically looking at how uh, the bank's portfolios of, of investment and financing and or, yeah, the entire portfolio could be um, aligned with some kind of, you know, more climate friendly uh, or, or more environmentally friendly pathway. And um, actually I was invited to speak at one conference in New York, I, I think it was, yeah. And it, I was flying across the Atlantic to speak about the decarbonization of, of, of banks portfolio with JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and a few other banks were there present. 
And being there, I understood the absurdity of that situation, right? So flying over the Atlantic for one meeting of talking about that and knowing profoundly that actually the problem is not about that. And this meeting wouldn't probably change much. And my presence there would not change much. But it was um, very interesting in the coffee break. I, I went down, it was the time of Occupy Wall Street and they, there were these people they're gathering and I, I went down from this luxury hotel and the hotel room down to, to the people and there was um, a person speaking and I later on found out that his name, I don't know, maybe when some of you have heard about him, his name is Charles Eisenstein and he's actually a, a philosopher. He, he wrote a book, which is the sacred economics and he, he writes a lot about the financial system and, and, and the looking very deep in what money actually is. And it was a very interesting moment. It got me actually, I, I, I felt anger about myself. Like I'm on the sort of on the wrong side, but they are as well. And Charles Eisenstein in that moment was as well. So at least we're not talking to each other, right? Something is not yet built here. We need to, we need to build something here. And that was my call in two different directions. One, it was my call, I really st stopped and I said, I cannot continue doing these kind of ju jumping around on conferences anymore and writing texts. And, and, you know, I heard in the introduction, it's not about think tanks anymore. We really need to do something. And um, so there was a group of professors at the time in the beginning around changing, making a suggestion for changing the constitution in Switzerland um, for basically um, something along the lines, it was called Vollgeld, so along the lines of positive money. So basically questioning, putting every Swiss citizen with confronting that with the question of, do you choose actively that you want that it continues that private banks create the money as debt or do we invite um, a different solution which was not so clear defined in that constitutional change but basically taking that um, right and responsibility to create money away from private banks and to um, an institution like in that case the national bank um, there were discussions of, around, obviously, what that means, what the conditions would be, how that mandate would be then controlled and how independent from politics that would be. But that was what we, what we came up with as a constitutional change. And that was a very interesting process then, which was around, yeah, a year, no, it was actually a few years, but it was the hot phase was really a year. It made it into the Financial Times uh, and, and in the international media, because you can imagine in a country like Switzerland, if the population entirely says yes, that would be the end of any investment banking in Switzerland, basically, right? And um, so that was a very interesting process. And we had um, international people, uh, central bankers, um, former bankers speaking around the world. And the interesting thing was that the more concrete it got and the more it was really in public and we were actually there on, on stage every second evening discussing with the leading people of the banks and uh, the national bank, there was a real consensus. It was not questioned that the current system is not working, at least not working in resilience. And that was very interesting. Of course, in the beginning, it was, there was a lot of defamation in the press and all of these things. But actually, in the whole discussion, there is a starting point, and that gives me a lot of hope. There was a starting point where even leading people within the banks and central banks were saying, basically, we have an issue here as, as society. Now, how we go about it and what the next possible step is, there are obviously different, different paths to go along. But um, just, just um, there, there were so many observations that it was, would um, be more than we have time probably here. One observation I had during that time of the campaign and during that time of really bringing that towards an election and getting 100,000 signatures first and then having an election so that really every Swiss citizen could vote on it, was that actually there were no women speaking about money. 
And that was something that was really very interesting for me to experience, that it was very difficult for women to speak up. It was very difficult to get engaged, um, capable women to, to be in this discussion around money. And I came to believe, and we started then even a campaign about what I call the feminine side of money, that this is something that is systematic. So this is part of, of the whole change. Because if you think about it, this extractive paradigm, which is really um, in, 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 a, in a very hierarchical way, um, is, is something which is sort of representing some, some very old patterns that we are in the process as, as a society to question and to overcome. And I, I realized that these, these qualities are really also qualities that when we bring in the, the next generation of what we would decide how money could look like, that, so that it serves us, need to be integrated in the discussion as well and in the whole design of the system. And in a moment, I will, I will give a glimpse of how that could look like. Um, so just to, to, on the result base, I think it was wonderful. So 25% of the Swiss population at that point, you, know, if you, you need to see at the moment where we did it in 2017, 18, basically from the polls in the beginning, more than 90% did not know how money was created. And that changed. Today in Switzerland, people at least know how money is created, which is a huge success. And 25% at this time said, well, we would like to change the system. And that's something to build on. So it was not a success in the, in the, in the way of, of, of winning an election, but actually for me, it was a huge success. And also I think it's not a yes or no question. It is a question, how do we collaboratively co-create this pathway rather than if it's about you know, winning a yes or no um, initiative. So this was, was that one path and decision that I took when I was standing there uh, in New York, <laughs> that I would become active on, on, on really changing the monetary system, even if people may not like it, and even with the risk that I may not be invited to another conference um, of the same central bankers, that it didn't, by the way, turn out to be true. And the second part was that I decided I need to really go into the risk myself and co-create the world we want to live in. So I became a social entrepreneur and I went back also to the country where I grew up, which is south of Portugal, because there the desert is coming. And I went into one region I was asked by two women in the beginning and we started the women's initiative there to really um, bring in holistically um, regeneration into that area, meaning that we, we started, we brought in the best agroecology pioneers that helped us to restoring one land plot after the other and creating what we call food networks, meaning that we team up the different farmers and deliver together to um, school canteens, elderly homes, and we work together with the municipality and in multi-stakeholder processes on a regional level. I've been doing that in different other parts of the world as well with other friends and other social entrepreneurs such as in Nepal, where we have been uh, bringing together 1,300 smallholder farmers um, for them to enable them to stay in the mountains or go back even as young people to the mountains and farm in a regenerative way. And then together to deliver the food to the next city, which is Pokhara, to the, um, in that case, to the hospital um, kitchens. And at the moment with the COVID situation where really the, the borders are sort of close to India and no food, no rice is coming in or less rice is coming in and food is getting scarce. We are in the process of scaling that up. So really enabling financial flows so that we can um, pay more or enable and give, a, give a, a agrarian basic income basically to farmers in the land and together with um, chefs without borders. So um, how do I say cooks without borders cook uh, for the people in the city. These are the real urgencies I see, I see in the world. I see it everywhere in the world. And that require hands-on solutions and different monetary solutions that really allow us to do that kind of caring, nourishing, restoring, regenerative work that reflect what we are as humans. Because we, I think we have the impulse of really, of really doing good um, and, and being there for each other. 
So what actually that is as the next thing I, that I, I started with many, many others to start working on and co-creating in terms of the new, let's say, I call it the new operating system for an, a new and regenerative world, are different puzzle pieces which basically can enable a resource-based economy. An economy that starts with, an, with this understanding of, of first, we have resources, right? It all comes down to relationships, so to humans. And we, if we start with the resources, and I can give you that example of, um, together with my partner with, um, from Israel, we have been co-creating a, or we are co-creating a, it's a startup peer-to-peer um, -peer marketplace with an um, integrated complementary currency. And it starts, as, a, as an example, it starts, um, with the resources. If you think about it, you know, we have so much abundance. We have so much abundance in the world. There is no scarcity. If, if you look at it as an example, our the biggest shop of the world, you may think it's Amazon, right? But it's not, it's us. It's us, the people. And if we start there, and that's what <laughs> we did, uh, we said, well, we, there are so many things that clothes, um, toys, books that, that we have actually. And they, what is missing is an effective way of giving value to them. And there is um, a lack of the possibility to bring it into, again, the water, to bring it into circulation. And this is really something I understood within this path of 20 years, which is that the X factor of the economy is velocity. It's really velocity. It's not that there's a lack of money. It's that the money is stuck. So if we can create mechanisms so that this, if, if imagine a book that circulates in a, in a community. And if the, the, it circulates really fast, you know, 10 people read it, that creates a vibrant community. It creates prosperity. And the same is true for a note of hundred dollars. If it circulates from the barber to the farmer to the, if it circulates fast in, in, in the village or in a community, that is what creates real abundance and, 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 and um, community. So what we created is actually a marketplace, an app where people can upload things that they have. And then when you have things on the marketplace, then we create the currency according to that. So first are the resources, and then you create the currency. And then you create a reward system that rewards the kind of relationship uh, that we want. And the relationship that we want, for example, the values could, are that we reward when we fulfill each other's wishes. We, full, we reward when we start to deliver on the way to the grandparents, on the way to the school, on the way to um, things that, that, so that the delivery is also without any additional emissions, you know. So um, it, it rewards resource-friendly um, and caring behavior or, um, yeah. So basically, if we can design a system, and there are many, many different things how, how we could scale a design that we could design that for companies, so peer to peer, peer to peer, but for companies. And we could design that for renting, we could design that for services. Um, he gives the guitar lesson to, he gives. And the key thing is always to think about it like we have the resources first, and then we create the, 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 the money afterwards, and then we bring it in circulation. Very concretely, what we did is we said, well, if we want to change the world, it makes sense to just prototype and start with women. Um, and we started with women first 60, then 600, then 5,000. And with 5,000, it was a real experiment. It was that was in, in Israel for one and a half years to really understand how does that currency behave? How did that does it work? And um, well, now since half a year, it's, it's, it's viral. It's um, um, it's open for the public there. And we could really show that um, more than 100,000 transactions were made. And um, it's, it's, it's getting a lot of traction. And if we then plug this system in with, for example, that whole new world, which is, which is emerging and uh, through the blockchain of, of let's say, consciously um, created currencies for storing value, 
we could really create a water-like system that waters those regions um, can even be designed and it is there are um, possibilities to, to design these currencies in a way that the more a region for example through regenerative projects through really creating vibrant uh, local communities through um, restoring the land that appreciates in value and then you plug in these kind of local marketplaces with fast circulating currencies which then enable um, that local resilience to to flourish that's like just to give you an example of why this is important, maybe you know the phenomenon what happens when Walmart comes to town. When Walmart comes to town to a little village somewhere, basically all the mainstream, all the normal shops, they, they don't have a chance, right? So they close and people start working for Walmart and they start, if they are luck, lucky, they get a job at Walmart. And then they start shopping and doing their things on at Walmart. But the money actually all goes back to Arkansas. So it goes out of this one way, right? It goes to, to Arkansas. It doesn't return. It doesn't stay in, this, in, in the city. So if we design these systems in that way, um, in, a, in a clever way, I believe that we can really set people free. And that doesn't mean that I would stop to engage with Congress people about changing the monetary system. I still believe that having a national monetary system which is debt free is the way to go. But I just wanted for that just alliance to broaden that spectrum and just really see, I think we are not helpless if the politics moves a bit, you know, slow. So, and uh, we can come up with very creative system. Now, one interesting thing is that it's very interesting. I met on that path very few people that really deeply understand what money actually is and how it can be used to create prosperity. One last thing, and then I, I, I give it to, to the next, or I give it into the round so we can have questions if the time permits. Is think of it, what, how, how much prosperity we could actually enable if we would use that mechanism of reverse engineering of the money system also for donations. So imagine, what is, how is it today? If we take the example of a million dollar that um, goes from the US to some, I don't know, some, some African country or so or for, 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 as a donation, right? Philanthropy. You know, by the time it leaves the Statue of Liberty saying goodbye, already half of this is, is on some kind of a donation party or some, some is gone, right? So for the whole overhead and administration. And then, uh, there are lots of things within that new country or within this uh, country which needs to be fulfilled and there is another organization. So basically you have only a few hundred thousand from that million left to do actually something and then you need to do a lot nice film to say to really, yeah, I don't know, having some community people that wave nicely the hand and that goes back to the donors in, in the US to, to really ask for the next million. This is a little bit how it works today. But if we really understand how money works, we could reverse engineer that. And that could be like, we could start with a million, but instead of just donating that, we would use what we learned, how money works. So we turn it through a social bank into 10 million. A bank can do that, right? And then we just don't do that, donate it either. We invest it into assets in the community that then turns the, the, the yeah, uh, basically community owned co commons. As an example, it could be solar panels. And then, because that's, that's very important. And then you have, you know, clean energy for that community, which you can even give with a discount and a cheaper price as the dirty normal energy. But now the trick comes, how do you get it? You only get it for the community currency. You only get it for, let's say the good coin, right? That we have created now. So that's a way that's a way how this currency will then be very attractive in the community, right? Because if you then go to the farmer's market and want to buy, you know, your tomato and, and, and your food, and you ask, well, do you want dollars? Or in that case, if it's in Africa, shilling, or do you want um, the community currency? Of course, they want the community currency because with that, they can have access to those, uh, for example, the, the discounted um, 
um, clean energy from the community or it can also be for the water system it can be for for many it can be for the elderly home care it can be for many many other things and by that we give that com that community currency really the value and that really becomes then a game changer because until now all of these um, you know um, let's say pilot cases at least that i am aware of of, of community currencies um, that existed let's say also without the new technologies um, were more or less for exchanging a few embroideries or, or a few shops that were accepting that, right? But applying really the monetary knowledge to that approach, that could become, I would say, something like a weapon of mass construction instead of destruction. So for now, with that thoughts, I would I would leave it up to questions and um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That was so inspiring. I am on the verge of tears right now because that was just a very beautiful, beautiful display of the work that you're doing and. Wow. Um, so for this next section, um, yeah, if you want to, this will be a Q&A format. And if you want to um, raise your hand, I will let you unmute to ask your question. Otherwise, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, but yeah, I will uh, kind of jump in to signify or signal who should uh, speak first. Um, but so yeah, gather your thoughts. Um, I do want to just shout out a few things that stood out to me um, from what Katarina shared. And I think the, the best part for me was when you um, talked about the peer to peer um, app that you have and how you tested it on women first um, and just that what how you centered women in that um, is just beautiful and I hope you know we all take note of that that women are a powerful force and um, yeah that was just really great um, and on top of that, just the creativity that you all have, um, that your team and the people that you're working with, the creativity that you all have, it just inspires me so much here in the United States to really think outside of the box, different ways that we can really change the money system. So um, I just am grateful to have this connection and look forward to seeing what you all are doing. Um, so yeah, I will open it up for a Q&A. And I think John got in line first. Um, so John Howell, if you want to ask your question. Well, I'd like to express my thanks to you, Dr. Serafin Mova, for this uh, lovely presentation. Um, and I think you have spoken to the power of local currencies, which have played an important role so much through history in many, many places. Um, and, and, and as far as monetary reformers, I think the problem we have so much is that our approach at a national level seems so abstract to many people, it's hard for them to kind of uh, grab a hold of it. And local things are things that people can get a hold of. So it's very attractive to think about ways you can do something with money locally. And you've described that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. The question that, that I always have about this is the fact that uh, there is a long history of, 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 uh, of alternate currencies, and the stories have often been sort of repetitive. They last for a while, doing very important things for a community, but it's for a while because circumstances change and then it gets expensive to maintain a local currency and it's not as competitive anymore um, with other currencies around like national currencies. So, and, and one of the questions that's always raised and among monetary reformers is, well, yeah, we could do these local currencies, but the likelihood of this, these coming together to, to make a dent in this process of bank creation of money, 
that's the step that's hard for many of us to get our minds wrapped around. Mm -hmm. Can you help us with that? Well, I can just share what I learned. I, I, that's what I, what I saw as well. And I think, yeah, it's, it comes down to, you know, you have two, two ways basically of, of, of creating trust or creating acceptance of a currency, right? One is really, if you, if you manage to gain trust in a community or, and that's the more likely thing, I would say violence, because, you know, if you really look at it, it's, it's backed by the state, right? The, the, the normal currency. And that's always, if, if, if you leave it by that, it's, it's through power and it will always win in the end, if you look at it from, from just how we looked at it from the past. But if I look at it from the future, this picture is different. And that's what I, I always try to see what comes from the future and tune into that rather than, than the other way around. And I, I um, do believe that the trick is really creating velocity, you know? So if we manage to, this, this, this particular app, or you can, you know, just, the, the idea is to bring it really in the direction so that it is open source, so that communities around the world can then in the future use it. But um, the, the idea is really to um, enable a situation where people can shop without money. This is very attractive. So you don't need to tell about the currency. You don't even need to say it's about the new currency, right? It's just an award-based system, which is within the marketplace, because these are the ingredients that, that a, a local a local regional flourishing I don't know, community needs, right? They, you need a marketplace for exchange and you need a reward system that rewards what you want to see. And you, want, you need velocity in the system. And if, if you manage to get that right, um, there, there is, that's, that's going to be very attractive and that's what we are seeing at the moment. And this mechanism that I described before if you then start with the resources and if you start with the assets and you deliver the real needs for the people with a discount in that currency, that will be a game changer. And that wasn't done as far as I know before in too many places. In Virgil, in the original, which probably you that are studying these things are more familiar, part of that was, was um, implemented already. So it's nothing new that we are actually creating here. Does that answer your question? Well, um, I can see where you're going with the answer. Um, uh, and I don't expect to get much more clarity on that because we're going into the future and, and, and it's hard to find, find real clarity in a substantive way like we would all like to get a hold of. So I appreciate your answer. Uh, it's time to go on to other questions. Yes. <laughs> Like to go it is on to you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I, I loved it. Um, I have two thoughts. <clears throat> the first one is that you started off with Rudolf Steiner, and I'm a student of Rudolf Steiner, and just, uh, you know, thinking about humanity and our spirit and soul is so important in this world. Um, so thank you for that. And secondly, uh, you made a very, very big uh, statement about the key are that the resources are first, and then there's the effort to deliver to the real needs of humans. And, and you said this was never done, but we do have a history in the United States called Parity Economy. Um, and I would like to invite you uh, in the future to come talk to our group. There's a group of monetary reformers that are working on getting this word out because there is a history from 1936 through to 1950 of a group of, um, it was started by a farmer and then statisticians joined and they proved that all wealth comes from the earth and that it can be equal, it can be fairly the price at first point of sale if it's fair. Now, you know, fair meaning all of the producers of this wealth 
right? They get enough money so that they pay all the people that have worked for them and they have a left over for their family and it circulates through the entire economy within that nation. And no one has to go into debt. And our national Congress passed a law from 1942 to 1950 and implemented that in our nation. So I'd love to invite you to learn more oh, about that. I would love to learn more about it. What I meant is that it comes probably of my own urgency. I think we need to really move I foresee a bit shaky times in the economy, maybe, <laughs> in the next times. And I believe that we need to put these systems in place at scale, you know, in, or let allow the emergence everywhere in the world. And that scale was not yet, or I didn't see it, but I would really love to learn from these examples. And there are a million of really beautiful examples, and especially also, um, I, I know, for example, of one of these crypto coins, which is influenced by the Mayan culture, so it's actually based on indigenous wisdom. So I, I, I am fully aware that there is so much that we can learn from the past as much as from the future at the same time. So I'd love to be part of that. Okay. All right, on to Paulo. It's so funny. I was just thinking about complementary currency this morning. Um, I have two questions. I'll try and make them. One is, I want, how is the, the Volgold, Volgold movement going? Is it, is it going to go for another, another round as number one? And number two is, you, boy, you nailed it when you say it starts with the resources. And I, I would even go a little further and say it starts with the wealth that each of us creates. We all have wealth and I want your wealth you want my wealth and the only way that we can get the wealth that we need to survive is through a medium and money is is probably the only way that i can see now but i have a question and i've been struggling with this in my world local does not exist there is no such thing as local everything now is national or international and it seems like the opportunities for complementary currency are dwindling, in, at least in the US. And, and I don't know what to do about that. Um, so, so how do you overcome the kind of universality of trade now that um, maybe didn't mm -hmm. exist or doesn't exist in, in less developed countries or in the past? Well, that's a complex that, yeah. So the first question is, um, maybe quicker to answer, although not complete. There are, um, the, the Fallgeld movement still exists, so there are still people working and meeting and continues. In terms of, at the moment, I'm not aware that we are, or people are planning another initiative. There is another initiative at the moment um, on um, the unconditional basic income, which was the other part, which was um, in, in the plans or in the, in the moves. Um, and that is a, a micro tax um, initiative. So to basically tax all the financial transactions of banks. So that's also in the in the move in Switzerland. So I'm not aware that the Folgert is yet again, but it could well be. I personally decided of, of, of at the moment, not, not my forces of rather bringing into that creation, creative part as a, a more entrepreneurial approach, because I or do you believe that we don't have years of time to get something done so that communities around the world actually are prepared and resilient so that they can function even if the system is a bit shaky out there? And that's what I, what the, my why, right? So that's why I'm not setting yet another time on the big politics. And um, the, the second question on, on the local scale versus, you know, I, I do believe that interconnectivity, global interconnectivity is part of the solution. Like we are talking now, we are sort of, you know, connecting and, and joining forces for, for that kind of transition and change. And that's part of the solution. Such as, you know, we created in these food networks, this initiative, which is a local initiative to really connect the farmers with the, the, the rural area, with the urban area in Nepal. And, and cross-financing that through <laughs> selling the, the holy basil, which is a tea from Nepal that the farmers use in the land around the vegetable beds, 
in a traditional way. And we were selling that, or we are selling that in Switzerland to a higher price to cross financing that. So the two food networks are helping each other. So this kind of interconnectivity between the local. And yes, if you look from a political part, this local does not yet or does not exist anymore. But neighborhoods do exist, right? And, and in, in a way, um, local communities do exist. They, they don't have yet the representation in terms of a function, not marketplace, but in the moment where you give them that as a tool, they will naturally use it. That's my hope and that's also what we see. So I'm not speaking about a political intervention, but rather a disruptive um, offering that we could bring in and see what happens. So you don't need any, any politician to say yes to that or no. You need to stay sort of legal, and that's why we didn't start with services because you get in the in the in the in the question about taxes, and it just it's not funny if you offer your services in points or whatever it is, then and you need still to be pay the taxes in fiat money. So there are some some things that need to be changed, but that can be overcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Virginia. Can you uh, please say more about the reward system? Yes. So um, the way it is created and, um, is, is really that when you, when you, when you enter the platform, you, you welcome by you get something. So the, the first entry is you get points, right? So welcome, here you are, you can start playing. It's very gamified, it's a game. Welcome and you get some points. Then you upload your items, say your dresses or your shoes or your toys into the platform that, that you would like to offer, right? And you get points. And then if you, if you start selling off, obviously you, you get points. If you say, okay, I could actually deliver, and, and it was interesting because the delivery system grew out of the community. It wasn't planned. It grew out of the community. And today there are 500 regular routes around Israel, the entire country. So um, basically, if you then say, okay, I can, I can take for that lady, I can take it because I, I, I go anyway to the aunt. Uh, that, so I, I bring that, that uh, delivery, you get points. And then there are features like, you know, fulfilling wishes. Imagine you have a wish you, you want, you know, for, for the, very quickly for the present for your grandchild, you want Winnie the Pooh, the book, or, and 30,000 people try to help you to, to fulfill your wish. That's a very, it's a very, it, it creates generosity just as, as the way it is designed, you know? <laughs> and it's very playful, but there's no way, we, we can design our systems, our monetary systems, very playful and as much as we want, we are free. Right? So this is probably just, if you have other questions, but this is in a nutshell how it works. So basically, and it is, it is designed in a way that if you don't spend, or at least there is a possibility of demorage in the system. So it's, it's not a, about um, accumulating your points, it's about giving them, right? And there are also possibilities then in the, in the future of donating them. And for example, how it was used also, it's not in that, pilot case, it was also used um, in the way that I described, a little bit in the way that I described for donations. So in, in, the, in, the, in the situation of the corona crisis, actually more and more um, help organizations and, and, and NGOs had actually a lower budget, like lower income, right? Less donations, and they had a difficult situation. And at the same time, there were more and more people that really needed help. So what was created together with social delivery was actually a situation where, you know, um, unfortunately restaurants closing down, hotels closing down, could donate their equipment, banks that changed their computer uh, system could donate everything um, into the platform. They were uploaded and then you have a value, right? You have a balance, you have a value. And according to that, the money was created and that money was distributed in poor, for example, in uh, Bedouin uh, neighborhoods. Um, to the people, first to NGOs or social workers, right? That could then really go shopping in the points, um, got, get a monthly budget, some kind of, and then also it was done like a, not a universal basic income, but we, then, we, we call it a Kabubi community asset-based universal basic income to people. And um, that, that created a lot. And then you can have then, if you have different neighborhoods, let's say a poor neighborhood, and then you have a richer neighborhood, and you first start 
with that donation to get a local market going. You can imagine that in <clears throat> conflict areas around the world. And then they start trading amongst themselves. And then there's a rich neighborhood and they start even, it has also a social component, you know? People start having relationships. They start, you know, delivering to each other. They start um, talking to each other. Maybe that is part of, especially you can imagine in Israel, part that didn't speak other um, backgrounds and religions and they, they start talking to each other and, and uh, delivering things to each other. So that, that, that's, I think, the, the change-making possibility of really, you can say when we go back to, car, um, to Rudolf Steiner, bring it into the new phase, it, it's, it's a good karma app, right? It's an app that enables um, good, good behavior or good relationships. Thank you. Um, Lucille had a question in the chat. I'm not sure if she wanted, I thought it might be nice for her to um, ask. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much, Katarina. Um, interesting presentation. And um, I wanted to share, I'll put it in the chat too, maybe I, you may know of the late Margaret Kennedy, but she was a, a peer of, of Bernard Littier and started Moneta. A, a group, I think, based in Germany that works on local currencies. And shortly, be, she, I met her at this, mm -hmm. this 2004 conference, um, and we, we had a little correspondence. We met uh, once in Germany at her eco village where she and her, her spouse lived, um, both yeah. architects. Anyhow, um, she she did speak to sort of the question that's being raised a bit of, of the meso level monetary reform, which I think is what local currencies are about, and the macro level reform. And um, I think Joseph Huber agrees with this, and I do. And in this last communication with her, Margaret mm -hmm. communicated that she agreed that it's a both end and that we that people that working at the local level is um, must be cognizant of the effects of the macro level existing system and that um, we don't change it. Um, if we leave that in, if we just have blinders on on local currencies, then we um, uh, leave that greater system in place to do its damage much longer. I, but I, the question I really wanted to raise um, is, and that's what I wrote in the chat, is that given your, your deep background and experience working on money that, that you described, can you explain your answer to the question that I think you posed, if I heard it right? And, and I phrased it, how, can you explain how money and rather than the interest-bearing credit that we mm -hmm. now access money that we have, um, how does money resolve its apparent, I think they're apparent, not necessarily real, they are currently, but with money, how, how does money resolve its apparent opposites of being able both to store value and to recirculate value at greater and greater velocities um, as, as people exchange. Um, and that value being, you know, the value that's embodied in, in their goods and services that they produce and, and that are produced by all the people whose right. name that money bears. Um, and to me, that, that was shifts that to the macro level, all the people, but can you explain Yes. Uh, restate my question. How how does money, as you understand it, money, real the money we're after, just money, how does it resolve its apparent opposites? Yeah, thank you very much. I love that question. And actually, I, I brought Margaret Kennedy at the time to Switzerland to help us uh, frame the text for the constitution in the in the way that it opens up for the possibility for local currencies as well so that it's not exclusive and it was a tiny thing so i knew her a little bit 
And also then uh, actually he was a good friend of my partner who created Chariot, this, this app and platform. So then Bernard actually in his last talk, he explained the, his vision of how these ecosystem of solutions, how what we now call Chariot could be plugged as one part of the solution in the bigger picture. And I think this is going into the answer to your questions. I do believe, and that's again, my analogy on the, ecosystem and us being part of a living organism and me understanding the money as water. And you, you can think of really big um, water flows, like these big streams around the world, right? And they are for me like, you know, um, a, a currency that is about storing value, a currency. And I brought as an example, these new, we can also have other currencies, but I, I brought in as example, you we want to have a currency where you can store value and it doesn't really move a lot, right? It's sort of stable. You, you, you want, and that's like the head, it doesn't, shouldn't be shaking so much, but then an operating currency, an operating currency for a local community or regional community or, or whatever you, you say, that, that wants to, as you say, it's, it's, it's behaving even in the opposite way, right? Circulating very fast, maybe even having demorage if the velocity um, is, is not really, you know, this MV equals PQ money times velocity is price time quantity. So, so this, this understanding that you really need that velocity on the local level. So I believe it's really about designing currents different, an ecosystem of different interconnected currencies. And you will need, hopefully, then a debt-free uh, national currency. Yes, you will need that. And then there will be probably an ecosystem of different um, cryptocurrencies around, right? That's help people store value. And as I said, ideally in a way that it appreciates the value, the better and more healthy the local or the, the regional economy is. Um, seeds, I don't know if you're familiar with that, is, is one of these currencies. It's called joint seeds, you can, can look it up. And then you may have even other currencies, you may even have um, on, on, on a regional level for, or you have even for a university, they can come up with an owned currency, why not? But then you want to have a currency which is adequate for a marketplace, for really exchanging the things that people need in their ordinary and normal lives and that they can shop and buy and sell goods and services for. And that's an operating currency, right? So I do believe that the future is really a well-designed ecosystem of different solutions. So how you can answer another question, how do you do it, right? And that's where the local comes in. That's where the, the real doing and testing it comes in. If you have that marketplace and you have that point system, reward system, currency, however you want to name it then, also for legal reasons, and then it's, it's, it requires a little bit of a monetary understanding and design to make sure that you don't flood that system because then you cannot ensure that the, the liquidity and the, the velocity really on the local level really functions and the resources that are represented are in, in sort of a healthy relationship with the, with the money in circulation. That needs a little bit of a literacy. And I think this is also something that I would love the, the Alliance of Just Money to really, we need to be more people that really understand the money and that we can design these systems and that we can help um, for the purpose and the question that we want to solve <laughs> to design the appropriate um, monetary design. And there I see really the future and where you as an organization and we together can really make a difference. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring up Mike next. He asked a question in the chat and I would just like to give him a chance. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, first of all, thank you for your presentation. That was uh, uh, very good and interesting and I appreciated your comments. Um, so I had two questions in the chat. The second one uh, was already brought to your attention. So the first one regarding monetary sovereignty. Um, do you believe that monetary sovereignty is an important requirement uh, for the, for the, to have a just money system? And the reason I'm asking this question 
is because about your comments regarding local currencies and having an ecosystem of local currencies. Our organization uh, believes that it is the creation of money and who is in control of the creation of money that is a, a critical part of how the economy functions and how the money is used when it is created by the people who are allowed to do so in society. Of course, right now, banks and shadow banks have that authority and we seek to eliminate that. So I guess, could you help me to resolve in my mind this sort of conflict between having multiple potential sources of money creation while having a national sovereign money system? Uh, well, first of all, I think it, there is something coming from the future which is happening if we like it or not, which is that we will have complementary currencies. And I wouldn't probably speak less about local currencies, but about complementary currencies. And this is also a development which is triggered by technology. So it's not only about the decision that we may like or not like, but it's just happening, right? So, so this is, I think this is just something that I, I, I would like to, to address. And, and then, you know, the question about sovereignty, I, I agree, but it's, it's more theoretical what we wish for, right? And this is exactly what we, what we, were, um, what we were addressing with, with the Folgeld Initiative. And that's, that's in the end a political, maybe a bit a slower process of, of awareness rising, of, of, of really people coming to the joint conclusion and, and even more and more people understanding what money actually is and how the system works today and what the consequences are, right? But I don't, I don't know if I got your question right about where you see the, the um, I don't know, the conflict between a debt-free national money and complementary currencies on, on, let's say, for different purposes on a more operating level. Would you, because, you know, with that sovereign money, you would still be be able to, to address things that relate to the state, right? On the city level, you could even imagine to address things that are related to the city. And on the marketplace level, you could, you know, um, relate to a currency that is more appropriate for that purpose. So I don't know exactly where you think the conflict could be, but maybe I didn't understand. Yeah, so, so let me explain a little bit. It really has to do with who has the authority to create the money. And if you have complementary currencies, then you have a situation where you could have unregulated um, and unsanctioned, perhaps unscrupulous actors creating the money and using it for nefarious purposes. So I see that as kind of a weakness of, of local currency. Certainly it's a weakness of, of cryptocurrencies. And as a matter of fact, maybe that's why cryptocurrencies even exist um, is, is for those kind of purposes. And so I do have some skepticisms, of course, about uh, who is creating the money and why they would be creating the money in a local currency ecosystem. And I think that could lead to instabilities. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is a result of the, the current money system being operated by unscrupulous actors and using it for their own purposes and designing the system to siphon wealth upwards. Um, so that's a concern that I have about the system design is how do we ensure that the money that's created is used not to benefit one's own corrupt interest, but to benefit society at large. I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think this is probably, that's a very deep question. And I think for me, it's about setting people really free, right? Really free. And, and uh, whenever something is, 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 is dependent on, on basically power and centralized power, it's just my personal um, observation that when I look at uh, the, the entire let's say paradigm shift that we are in, this does not seem to come from the future. It seems more to come from the past. So I, I do believe that we, if, if we are to really go into a future of coexistent collaboration, collaboration with nature, that we need to find new ways of really basing our decision-making processes more collaborative on, on generating trust with each other rather than you know, forbidding and having a few up there who decide. So that's that's a bit. But we could go very very deep on that. I'm I'm aware. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I do want everyone to be mindful of time. We've got about 10 minutes left uh, before we uh, go off into a break. So we have um, Howard, Hovert, uh, Luciano, and Greg. And then I know there's still some questions coming in. So um, let me know, or you can send any questions that don't get answered to me and then uh, we'll forward them along to Katerina because I'm sure we will not get to all of them as we only have 10 minutes. I can't believe it. Um, so yes, Howard, go ahead. All right, thank you, Katerina, <coughs> for bringing up all those various different things. <laughs> uh, I kind of uh, got into the money thing um, because I got into politics and immediately, you know, saw where the power was. And of course, I got into politics because I'd been into permaculture and the eco village uh, movement and all of that kind of stuff, seeing that uh, what they needed was a government that supported. Them. So I got into uh, complementary currencies first, looking at all of that. And, uh, and then I discovered the monetary reform of AMI and um, uh, and the history of it. And so we have a history of uh, monies that did work. And so I, th I think the future in terms of cyber, I don't think it has any future because of the energy footprint there. I don't think that's going to happen, <laughs> uh, you know, with uh, any resiliency. And um, I am... Um, think too that uh, the psychological aspects that you mentioned are very important because if we're trying to create a network within a system uh, that psychologically impacts us to not want to collaborate and not wanting to cooperate that's the the research uh, has already shown that uh, operating in society that way that retards cooperation and so to work against that is kind of hard. Well, what I've always said is that the complementary currencies are a strategy for surviving within the current system. But the experience at Wardle was very different because you see that wasn't a network currency. That was a public money currency that was issued by the government, by the local government. And so I think for local currencies to work, it's, I think money is a function of governance and that it would take uh, local governments to do it. And of course, we the people can uh, elect our local governments. And so we should be able to get uh, a good money system started through that way to put pressure on the bigger picture for the macro system to uh, get its act together right too, because it breaks down every eight to 12 years and is a, represents a massive transfer of wealth from the many to the few. Um, so I, uh, now somewhere in there, I had a question and I can't remember exactly what it was, but-, I, but um, there, there is something that I, I really appreciate and I would re like to react to if I may, because it was, if, if we think about it, what's actually politics? For me, politics is the power, who has the power to distribute, to decide and distribute resources. And the little mechanism that was, I, I refer to it as that weapon of mass construction, which was obviously not, but it is really, this reverse engineering really acts to that point. Because if we start to engineer the system in a way and really deeply understand money and reverse engineer that, and we start to recreate a situation where we own locally, regionally, right, as the people, <laughs> the resources, such as I, I brought just as an example, the solar panel, but we can, we can really broaden that to many things around what is, um, are the real needs for people, right? And we could go very deeply into the question of land ownership and we can, as all the collaborative comments, right? And if we create that and, and design the system in a way that um, the discount, and it's just about incentives, right? The discount is given when you get the clean energy, when you get the, you know, the local healthcare supply could be even organized in that <laughs> alternative way, right? So you can, you can really, if you really think it through, we don't need any, to ask any politician, even not on the, on the local level. There are some legal things that need to be, but we can, and it's politics. 
because it is about re reverse engineering the way how the distribution of resources work. And that I think in that direction, it's worth exploring deeper. I just, yeah. Thank you, um, Hovert. Uh, we we have about five minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it very short. <laughs> First of all, Katrina, thank you so much um, for taking our invitation to come and talk to us and, and sharing your, and I want, I want to make a special note of this for, because the next program we'll, we'll talk about narrative. And I so much appreciate and I like people to know that, that you enveloped these ideas within your personal life story, in your personal narrative. And that can have way more impact to get certain ideas conveyed to others than you know, an academic abstract uh, presentation. So I'm, I'm very uh, thankful for that. Um, I'd like to talk about global stuff, but maybe uh, because of time, I might not because you know, we got this UN Glasgow uh, uh, thing coming and I, I, I'm so impressed with your, your kind of holistic and very deep and high experience that, you know, as you said, you had your hands dirty in Portugal and maybe also Nepal. And by the way, I want that connection with Nepal because I intend to visit Nepal. Um, and at the same time, you had experiences with the UN, with the uh, Bank of International Settlements, with the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So I totally get your local meso level of you know getting into the dirt but if you would have a message to the un conference in glasgow what would that be thinking of, you know for example one of our members wants to push for a global fed focused on decarbonization and and i think that's a wonderful um, idea so at that level what's who would you say that you trust? What kind of ideas should be pushed? May I think about it? Because it's, it's really, I, I don't believe in a institution as I described through my path and lobbying. I, you know, in the beginning of my career, I looked always for the leverage points for change and the biggest institutions, but from the nature of these institutions. And we could now go back into that female male principles. I'm not talking women and men, I'm talking about, you know, what, what that, um, but my, my experience was that within these very hierarchical, very slow, very big institutions, even their change is possible, but it's individual people. So I, I, I could think about a few things of, of how to engage and how to create with some of these people actually mm, discussions like we are having now where as individuals they can choose a different path and stand up with courage and, and, and really speaking from their hearts of what is it that is needed and they will know the answer what is it that is needed in order to change the system so that it serves the people and not the people becoming the servants of the of the system and, and that kind of discussions I would love to have, but it's not a, a suggestion that is a blueprint that I will hand over to an institution and hope they deliver it. If so, I believe more in acupuncture points for a change, really hitting and maybe a needle in a very, very specific place that may then have a disruptive effect um, rather than you know, coming up with another UN watered down resolution but that's my personal experience thank no, no, you thank you uh, maybe we can you know uh, continue uh, these discussions because they are there and, uh, and i'm i'm actually i'm i'm doing that at the moment i'm actually in in the regenerate forum uh, one of my initiatives what we are what we are doing is that we are taking people from the current decision making from the financial industry, mostly wealth owners, actually very, very rich families we are taking to regenerative projects to then co-creating with them how actually, what does that mean in terms of, of what the future asks us to recreate in terms of financial flows and 
them using their influence within the organizations or within the companies that they are in. <clears throat> so I, I do believe in, in this, this kind of triggering change. Thank you. Wow. Big round of applause for that. This has been wonderful. And we have some questions that we didn't get to. So Katerina, I will send them your way at some point. Um, but I hope we can continue this conversation. And I hope that you'll come back because, wow. This We'd love to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Wishing you all a very, um, I will, I will go out of the call now because it's, it's evening in Switzerland, but I wish you a wonderful conference and festival. I love it by the way that you call it festival and not conference. It's something to celebrate the new. I love it. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank bye you bye. so much. Yeah. All right.